Hello, I'm Leonardo Puglisi. It's Sunday the 29th of May. You're watching 6 News, our top stories tonight. He is an F-wit, an unnamed moderate Liberal MP, reportedly slammed Scott Morrison, saying the party spent a full week, quote, being transphobes in Parliament, and then spent weeks during the campaign doing the exact same thing, as counting continues in seats nationwide, with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese preparing to name the new Labor cabinet. Plus, could Barnaby Joyce be out of a Nationals leadership job less than a year after returning Gippsland MP Darren Chester, preparing to launch a spill but concedes he's unlikely to win the party's leadership. And later... As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done? Shock and outrage grows as we learn more details about the horrific Texas mass shooting. Over 20 students and teachers killed at an elementary school in the city of Uvalde with horror expressed right across the United States and around the world. Good evening. We'll get to all that in a moment with our US correspondent Jackson Gosnell in South Carolina. But we begin here at home as counting continues in seats nationwide following last weekend's election. The result, of course, is fairly clear. Labor will form government. Tonight, though, we're still working out how they will do all that. We're expecting new details on the new cabinet as well as the shadow cabinet soon. Peter Dutton set to become the new opposition leader amid division over what directions the Liberals should take going forward following their election loss. An unnamed moderate Liberal MP has now told the Saturday paper that, quote, we spent a full effing week being transphobes in Parliament and then we spent weeks during the campaign doing the exact same thing and it was effing insane. And this person has even described Scott Morrison as an F-wit. Report Lincoln Holmes begins our special coverage and we do warn you that some of the language used in this report may be offensive to some viewers. Just one week after the Liberals' election loss, the former Prime Minister is being slammed by an unnamed MP in his own party. As reported in the Saturday paper, the MP said that Scott Morrison f***ed us and his fingerprints are absolutely f***ing everywhere on that. The bloke thinks he is a master strategist. He is a f***wit. We spent a full f***ing week being transphobes in Parliament and then we spent weeks during the campaign doing the exact same thing and it was f***ing insane. One Liberal MP also said that Morrison's office, quote, hated me and they briefed against me during the campaign. Fiona Martin, who lost her New South Wales seat, said the former PM never called her after the loss, the only outgoing MP who didn't receive a call. Dave Sharma, who lost his seat of Wentworth, has warned the party against moving to the right amid strong support for Teal Independence and the Greens nationwide. The Prime Minister is the leader, Scott Morrison, you know, ended up wearing the bulk of all of that as well. Uh, and it's undoubtedly true, and the national polling um, revealed this, was that, you know, as, as a government and as a Prime Minister, he had a net disapproval rating. Now, I'm not saying anything that's particularly insightful here, but obviously the reason we lost the election is because we weren't as popular as the other guys, and that reflects on all of us, not, not just Scott Morrison, it reflects on all of us. However, others believe Peter Dutton, who is part of the Liberals' national right wing, is the right man for the job. The new government is tonight moving forward under the leadership of PM Anthony Albanese. The full Labor cabinet is expected to be sworn in soon. Lincoln Holmes, 6 News. The Greens are set to pick up a fourth lower house seat in their third in Queensland, with Stephen Bates set to become the new member for Brisbane. While the results are already clear in Melbourne, Ryan and Griffiths, Brisbane remain too close to call until tonight. We've been campaigning in Brisbane for well over a year now and you know, we got the vibe from people that the community, they were fed up, they were seeing no action on climate change, they were seeing a government that was just bought up by the fossil fuel industry and wasn't doing anything to help people. So we got a lot of sense of, a huge sense of frustration and yeah, that's just, you know, turned into this amazing result. Well, meanwhile, the Nationals may be about to have their third leader in the space of 12 months, with Darren Chester said to contest the party's leadership tomorrow. The Gippsland MP has admitted he's unlikely to defeat Barnaby Joyce, who regained the leadership after a spill against Michael McCormack last year. Border Austin Pollock has more. 
It has barely been a week since the federal election dealt the coalition a rather poor result, with voting swings in most electorates. However, the Nationals haven't come off as badly as the Liberal Party, retaining every seat the party contested and also picking up a seat in the Senate. And even in seats which were at risk, um, we held them. And in seats that we stood, we got within an inch of winning them, of Lingiari and Hunter. So the Nationals don't have a problem. The Nationals have done an incredibly good job. But already a leadership spill may be on the horizon for the Nationals. Barnaby Joyce has been the elected leader of the Nationals party and that restores him to the position of the Deputy Prime Minister after he prevailed against Michael McCormack. Less than a year after Barnaby Joyce was sworn in as Deputy Prime Minister and Nationals leader, the former Minister for Veterans Affairs, Darren Chester, is going to challenge the Joyce leadership, said it's time for a change. Often seen as one of the more moderate members of the party, he said in a statement on Facebook, for the Nationals to connect better with younger and female voters in the future, we need to recognise the diversity and views in our regional areas and I believe I can do that. He also said, after each election, it's a natural transition point for the party and leadership roles are declared vacant. It's also healthy for the democratic process. He also told nine newspapers on Monday that he's not here to tip a bucket on Barnaby Joyce. He's the leader and he's done the best he can do. For who else may be contesting a role, there is talk inside Parliament that the party's deputy leader, David Littleproud, may try and contest a position and speculation that the former party leader, Michael McCormack, may also be in the running. Tomorrow, the Nationals will meet here in Canberra where they will discuss future party positions. Well, could the Teal Independents run in the Victorian and New South Wales state elections? Reports in the AFR and The Guardian indicate Climate 200 founder Simon Holmes a court is considering funding candidates for both those elections after the Teal way we've seen federally. In Victoria, candidates may be backed in the seats of Hawthorne, part of the Kuyong electorate, Kew and Bryson, part of the federal Kuyong and Goldstein electorates federally. Hawthorne is currently held by first-term Labor MP Josh Kennedy, while Kew is held by Liberal Tim Smith, who won't be recontesting this year's election after his drink-driving car crash. The Victorian election is in November, while the New South Wales election is in March next year. For more comprehensive coverage on that, you can visit our website, 6newsau.com. Also, for the latest federal results too, and check out the latest edition of Spin Check with more on the reports as well. That's available on our YouTube channel right now. Overseas now, the First Minister of Wales, Mark Dreyford, has announced plans to ease COVID restrictions, saying the country can look forward to a brighter future. A mandate requiring people to wear a face covering in health and health in health and care settings rather will end tomorrow, but authorised authorities have rather urged people to continue taking steps to protect their own health. Drakeford said that the government is prepared to bring back testing and contact tracing in the event of an increase in cases, but they currently aim to manage coronavirus as we, quote, would manage any other seasonal illness. Shock and outrage is tonight growing as we learn more details about the Texas mass shooting. Over 20 students and teachers have been killed at an elementary school in the city of Uvalde with horror expressed right across the United States and around the world. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done? Ten years since I stood up at a high school in Connecticut, a grade school in Connecticut, where another gunman ma massacred 26 people, including 20 first graders at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Since then, there have been over 900 incidents of gunfires reported on school grounds. Well, there are growing calls for action, but just how much can actually be achieved is yet to be seen. Earlier, I caught up with our US correspondent, Jackson Gosnell, for the latest developments. Definitely a lot of controversy and, of course, a very tragic situation that unfolded there in Texas at an elementary school. Law enforcement is under fire because it took them over an hour to make entry into the school 
parents were pleading with them to go inside and get their children. And now some of those parents who don't have their children anymore say those were critical moments where the police should have taken action. Now, as far as a timeline, the call came in about 1130 and then it took them forever, it seems like, in order to get inside where ultimately the shooter was shot and killed. Now, a lot of controversy surrounding how he got that weapon as well. Although the door was unlocked at the school and he went in, many people saying he shouldn't have been able to buy the weapons that he used. And there's been a large talk about gun control over here in the U.S. with student walkouts happening this week following the incidents in Texas, just all the way around a terrible situation. And you talk about gun control there, and we hear from leaders after it seems almost every mass shooting in the U.S. that there will be change, that they want change. Um, but in the end, there is almost no change after all these mass shootings. Are we actually expecting anything to come of this one? You know, Leo, I have seen an incredible amount of calls for change with this shooting. Now, every time there is a, a ter terrific shooting here uh, in the U.S., there are, are calls for gun control and, and change and tighter rules. However, with this specific case, I have seen more about gun control and gun safety measures than I have regarding any other uh, shooting in recent times. So, I think this will ultimately be the one that does get something done if it does. But you have to keep in mind, Republicans and Democrats are gridlocked on this. They they want to find a solution, it seems. But it seems at this point that neither side is really willing to give what the other one wants. So at this point, it's kind of gridlocked. But there are a lot of calls, certainly many more with this shooting than recent ones. Now, as we all know, this happened at a school, an elementary school. These are, for Australian viewers, primary age, uh, primary school age school uh, kids. You obviously are a student yourself. You're graduating, so congrats on that. But you would have obviously done many um, active shooter drills during your time at school. Can you explain to us here in Australia what they're actually like? Yes, yeah, certainly. So we actually conduct these on a pretty routine basis just to be prepared uh, in case something terrible happens. And so what happens is we actually call it a full lockdown drill. So um, members from the school will come on the intercom and let us know that it's a full lockdown. And so uh, on a full lockdown, that is when we go and hide. We get something to throw at the intruder if possible, because although the, the doors are always locked, if they're able to gain entry into the building and then into a classroom, we're going to fight back because you know, that person has a gun, we need to disable them somehow. So, you know, they say to grab anything in sight, really. So if you have scissors, perhaps, or if you have a book or pens, whatever the case, throw it at that person. We're actually told to do this uh, in many situations during drills because they want us to essentially fight if possible, uh, which according to researchers, they say that that's actually really a good thing to do aside from just hiding and ducking and waiting to uh, be found by the shooter. If you can fight back and try and disable them, then the odds are are much greater that they're able to do um, less harm than they may would have otherwise. So we go through these, as I mentioned, on a pretty routine basis. There are also tests done by uh, many school districts in the U.S., in which case they will have an intruder-like person go into a building um, and they will let them walk around and they test different schools to see how quickly they're able to recognize that someone from the outside is inside. They also work with law enforcement. So local law enforcement, typically, uh, at least where I am, they have a very good understanding of the setup in the school as to where the classrooms are, where the doors are, so on and so forth. And law enforcement actually comes in sometimes to participate in these drills so that they can be ultra prepared. And just finally, just quickly, here in Australia, we'll obviously have our own lockdown drills, but those are usually for things like an out-of-control dog on the school grounds, a student out of control, but not a student with a weapon. We'll have fire drills too. Is Are these active shooter drills and then, because we do see these mass shootings happen regularly, it's awful to say that, but it happens regularly. Is Are those drills considered like normal? Like do people just think, okay, it's, it's another drill because... I, I can't imagine having to do a drill um, based on the situation of a shooter coming into my school. 
You know, we've always had drills for various things. Um, the lockdown drill has been around for quite a while um, because if police are chasing a suspect around the school building uh, within, I think there's a there's approximately a mile of distance or something related to that, then the school would be notified and we would go into uh, kind of a, a halfway lockdown. Um, and then for the full lockdown, that's always been in place in case for example, a parent were to come into the front office and get super irate um, and potentially pose a risk to the children. We've always had these measures in place, but in light of school shootings, they've kind of transitioned from an irate parent or a, a minor security concern to more so of an active shooter type situation. Because as you mentioned, how you know it's very, very tragic and it's not to be taken lightly, but these things do happen more and more frequently. And uh, we always want to be the best prepared that we can be. And so although the drills have been around for a while, they've been kind of rebranded in a sense to focus more on school shootings. We'll leave it there. Jackson Gosnell, our U.S. correspondent in South Carolina for us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Jackson Gosnell reporting there. And now is Ivan and Melly with a look at what's coming up later tonight on WAMN News. Thanks, Leo. Tonight on WAMA News, jab mandates boost jobs. The argument that mandatory jabs for workers are benefiting both local businesses and the WA economy. A WAMA News exclusive. Suspension and expulsion reach record highs as violence remains a major issue in WA's public schools. Power blackouts continue to plague regional areas as residents and businesses cope with the financial fallout. Peter Kennedy's analysis of the Albanese government's new priorities, and later, Dr Andrew Miller's comment. Join us tonight on the WMN News Facebook page and YouTube channel. All right, thanks both Ivan and Melly. there. Now to tomorrow's weather forecast right across the country. Brisbane, partly cloudy, 23 degrees. A chance of showers, 17 in Sydney, starting the day at just 4 in Canberra, getting to a top of only 8 later in the day, believe it or not. 11 in rain in Melbourne. Hobart actually slightly warmer, warmer than Melbourne for once. 13, 14 showers in Adelaide, 18 in Alice Springs, 19 in Perth, and in Darwin, a warm top of 31. Before we go tonight, recapping our top story, and an unnamed Liberal MP has reportedly slammed Scott Morrison, describing him as an F-wit as counting continues in seats nationwide, with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese preparing to name the new Labor cabinet amid moves for a Nationals leadership spill. And that is 6 News for this Sunday evening. You can start today with all the latest headlines by heading to our website, 6 and by following us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Lit. Just search 6 News AU to find us. I'm Leonardo Puglisi. Thanks for your company. Good night.